Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we're coming to you on this Wednesday of the 28th week of Ordinary Time. Boy, how time flies. And I always like to remind myself and you why we're here to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, that he may be better known and loved and many may come to have eternal life. And we're doing that by jumping into his word, meditating on his word as a way of worshiping him. And we just have a basic, what we call a ferial day, a weekday mass today. No big uh, holidays or memorials. We've had a string of great ones. You know, we had the archangels, the guardian angels, Jerome, Therese, Our Lady of the Rosary. Well, things have calmed down a little bit this week. Uh, and we are meditating on the scriptures. And uh, where are we now in the lectionary? Let's remind ourselves. Um, in, our, in our first reading, we did a couple of weeks in the wisdom literature to take a break from St. Paul. And then we jump back to St. Paul, who's the usual uh, figure in um, the first reading or the, or the uh, uh, second reading on a holiday or Lord's Day. And we're back in St. Paul, and we're in Galatians, uh, but this is our last reading for Galatians. We've been in Galatians for about a week and a half. It's a short letter. It's a punchy letter. It's St. Paul's angriest letter, uh, where he's rebuking the Galatians for having abandoned the true faith, etc. Uh, but this is going to be our last reading from Galatians, and then we're going to move on to Ephesians, which... Um, not to compare St. Paul's letters, but I kind of like Ephesians a little bit more. It's, it's peaceful, it's beautiful theology of the church, etc. But all important, they're all favorite. Uh, anyway, uh, but we're finishing up Galatians. We're going to be moving to Ephesians tomorrow. And in the gospel, we're working through Luke. We're about, um, you might say, about midway through our uh, reading of Luke uh, in the second half of this year two the first half of year two, we uh, read through most of Matthew, and now we're in this other gospel. Okay, so that's where we are. And now, um, let's take a look at uh, Galatians 5, 18 through 25. Brothers and sisters, if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember that. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. Okay, I love this reading. It's significant that this is the, our last reading from Galatians. Galatians is one of Paul's epistles that many non-Catholics believe uh, teaches this unbiblical doctrine of salvation by faith alone. That's certainly how I understood uh, the book of, uh, book of Galatians uh, for uh, much of my life until maybe about age 30. So um, I grew up, of course, in a Calvinist tradition and we placed great emphasis on salvation by faith alone, that um, it was not your works that affected your salvation, whether for good or for ill, but just your act of trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Um, not purely intellectual knowledge, it was an act of the head and the heart, uh, but that was salvific. And then we did have this interesting theology that the works would naturally flow from that commitment. So we did expect that there would be some change of behavior. But you know what? The change of behavior was just kind of irrelevant to whether you were saved or not. The, the salvation was this by making this act of faith. And that's how we read um, St. Paul's uh, letter to the Galatians. But notice here, this is St. Paul's epistle, and in it he's supposed to be 
teaching this doctrine of salvation by faith alone, supposedly. But here, near the end of the epistle, he's absolutely clear that if you practice the works of evil, okay, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry has a huge list. A list, by the way, very interestingly, which has a very close comparison in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they likewise have uh, a big uh, a list of vices that reminds one quite a bit of uh, Galatians 5. But anyway, so he has this long litany of evils, and he says, I warn you, those who do such things, regardless what they believe, okay, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That should be a wake-up call, okay, that if we're practicing these things and think that just because we receive the Eucharist once a week or periodically go to confession or, you know, our grandma gave us a rosary or whatever, okay, that, uh, that we're going to get in the pearly gates, okay, nonsense. Not if we are practicing this, this kind of lifestyle. These, these, all of these things that St. Paul lists, lists, these are the opposite of love. None of these acts are loving. And God is love, okay? So all of these acts are a choice against God. All of these acts are a turning away from God. You can't continually turn away from God and then expect that somehow you're going to, you know, not, not reach your destination, okay? Think about that. If you turn around, if you do a 180 and you start walking the other way, how do you think you're going to get to what's behind you? That's like, you know, walking towards heaven, then you choose these sins, which is a choice of non-love, which is a 180, and you pursue that, and you think that you're going to get to what's behind you. No, that's, that's not going to happen. And, and St. Paul is emphatic about it. Then he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity. Against the, such there is no law, he says. And, and here, let's, let's wrap up on this reading with this final statement. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passion and desires. And if we could ask him, Paul, how, when did we crucify our flesh? He would say, in your baptism. Just go read Romans 6, okay? Uh, that's where he says, we've been buried with him through baptism, okay? And then raised with a new life. So the crucifixion of the flesh with its passions and desires happens at baptism. And, uh, and then we need to correspond with our baptism for the rest of our lives. And then if we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. Okay, there's two, there's two basic ways we can make an error <clears throat> here. Okay, one is the error of uh, salvation by faith alone understood in a very caricature way that I just believe, I make an act of belief, and then it doesn't matter what I do and uh, I'm going to be saved. And that's, that error is made by people who emphasize the first verse of our reading where it says, if you're guided by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So people take a verse like that and they run with it. Oh, I'm not under the law, okay? Uh, and they take law here to mean uh, the moral law, okay? I'm, I'm not bound by morality because I'm in the Spirit, okay? That's nonsense. You always have to ask yourself the question, what does St. Paul mean when he speaks of the law? And oftentimes for St. Paul, the law means the Mosaic law, okay? So if you're guided by the Spirit, yeah, it's true. You're not under the Mosaic law, so you don't have to offer animal sacrifices and uh, live outside the city if you've got a skin disease and a bunch of other things that is imposed by Mosaic law. But uh, that doesn't mean you're free from the moral law, okay? No one is free from the moral law because the moral law is nothing other than love of God and love of neighbor, and we're never exempt from that because that's God's very nature. And if we're going to be imitators of God, we have to imitate that. So anyway, one way we can make a mistake is say, oh, it's just a matter of belief. My actions don't matter. I'm not under the law, so I have freedom in Christ to go, I don't know what, get drunk, whatever. And that, that's a viewpoint that um, uh, you do find, uh, I'm sad to say, uh, surprisingly often in American Christianity, I don't have any percentages or, or anything like that, but I, I ran into it frequently when I was an urban pastor uh, for the first five years of my career. Okay, so you can make a, a great mistake there, and those people are engaging in 
mortal sins and they think it doesn't matter because they've made an act of faith in Christ. Now, the other way that we can make a mistake here is to think that we earn our way to heaven by our own power. Oh, oh yeah, Paul says I, I can't be- participate in immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry. So I got to try real hard to avoid those things and I've got to try real hard to love and be joyful and peaceful and patient, kind, generous and so on. And it's all about me and my effort. And that's what we call Pelagianism. Okay. The, the, um, the, the other heresy, you might f- call it a, an extreme form of Lutheranism. Um, and in this other, this, this, this works righteousness view, you might call that Pelagianism. This idea that, because from, from an ancient uh, uh, Christian heretic, Pelagius, who argued that you could basically earn your way to heaven if you just put forth the effort. Uh, neither of those uh, extremes is true. So what is it? Well, it's the Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit is the answer to this conundrum. That's why Paul says, uh, if we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> two things are true. Uh, the transformation of our behavior is essential to our salvation, that's true. And it's also true that we are not saved by our own effort. So what it is, is we need to let the Holy Spirit transform our behavior, right? Salvation is through trusting Christ to give us the Holy Spirit and then following the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus's spirit, okay? Allowing Jesus's spirit to live and work in us and through us and follow those promptings and allow him to purify us, to crucify the desires of our flesh, and to move us toward love, joy, peace, etc. So it's learning to be abandoned to the Holy Spirit. Then we do change how we live. Our lifestyle changes, our actions, our thoughts. It's very concrete. It's very real. There is a transformation. But it's not something through putting forth of our human effort. It's through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This, this is the key. It, you know, the, so many times I hear Protestants and Catholics argue about St. Paul, and I think, and sometimes, you know, you're both missing it, okay? There's a charismatic key, okay? A pneumatological, that means pertaining to the Spirit, key to St. Paul. The Spirit is the key to understanding St. Paul. Actually, uh, you know, the the, the teachings of the church get this right, uh, but not all Catholics uh, get it right. But the church teaching gets this right. All right, we have a psalm here. I like this. Uh, This is Psalm 1. Blessed the man who follows not the counsel of the wicked, nor walks in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of the insolent. Okay? So walking in Hebrew is a term for behavior. So his behavior is not that of the wicked, the sinners, and the insolent. Okay, so, so to be blessed, your behavior needs to change. You need to stop behaving like the wicked, the sinners, and the insolent. But what does this uh, man do? Well, it says, his delight is in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. I love this because this is, expresses a Jewish attitude toward the law. As Christians and as Gentiles, we often think of law as a negative thing. Oh, I don't want to be bound. I don't want to be opposed on. But the psalm says, no, the blessed man delights. He loves God's law. He loves these instructions. He values them. He sees them as a way of life. He's so grateful to have some direction. He's so grateful to know what to do in any and every circumstance because God has instructed him. And, and he just can't get enough of it. Keeps uh, studying it. And, and uh, for for pious Jews to this day, you know, in 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 um, in uh, conservative Orthodox uh, uh, Judaism, you know, th- the goal of holiness is to just meditate on God's law day and night, like the man described here in Psalm one. So um, that is uh, beautiful. And then our gospel is related to all of these things. Our gospel also grapples with, you know, behavior and belief and how one is saved um, uh, by those things. And uh, it's our Lord's uh, woes to the Pharisees. Uh, The Lord said, Woe to you, Pharisees, you pay tithes of mint and of rue and of every garden herb, 
but you pay no attention to justice and to love for God. These you should have done without overlooking the others. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the seat of honor in synagogues and greetings in marketplaces. Woe to you! You are like unseen graves over which people unknowingly walk. That's pretty insulting. Then one of the scholars of the law said to him in reply, Teacher, by saying this, you are insulting us too. And he said, Darn right. Okay. Woe also to you, scholars of the law. You impose on people burdens hard to carry, but you yourselves do not lift one finger to touch them. Woo! Okay. Jesus is on a roll in this gospel. And he's laying it on thick and uh, keeping it real, as they say. And um, what is the situation going on here? Well, I want to dispel a misguided notion that many people have. Many people think that the Pharisees were very, very moral people, that they had high standards of morality. And Jesus came and said, ah, you know, relax a little bit. Get a little bit drunk. Hang out with people. Get dirty. Stop having high standards. You don't need to have high standards of morality because here I am. I'm the savior of the world and you just have to believe in me and you don't have to worry about morality and, and that kind of stuff. So this is a common misconception and Pharisees are portrayed as these very morally uptight people. Now, I don't want to blackball all Pharisees. There were some Pharisees who were very good people. And uh, on a couple of occasions, Jesus compliments some of the Pharisees. So just keep that in mind. I don't want to broad brush and say every, every Pharisee was a rotter. But Jesus criticizes the Pharisees not for having high standards of morality, but for being sticklers for ritual law while being immoral. You get it? Okay, so it'd be like people that uh, are very concerned about, you know, I don't know, observing canon law and, and having the mass celebrated in, in a certain precise way, but these same people go get drunk and are promiscuous or something like that. And you'd be like, what's up with that? You're, you know, you're so concerned about the observance of canon law and, and you give up on basic uh, moral teaching of Christ? Okay, how does that go together? That's more like what the Pharisees were. So they are very careful about paying tithes, which is commanded by uh, the, the law of Moses, to the point that even on their spices, they would take 10% of their spices and give them. And Jesus actually doesn't criticize them for that. He says, that's fine. Actually, that, you know, we would say that sounds pretty scrupulous. But our Lord says, no, that's, I've got no problem with you doing that. He says, these you should have done, he says later, uh, without overlooking the others. So the question is, what does Jesus mean when he says, you pay no attention to justice or to love for God? Well, these two statements, justice and love for God, probably refer to two famous summaries of the entire law that are found in certain verses of the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> when the rabbis ask the question, how do you sum up the law of God? There were a couple well-known verses in the Old Testament that they would typically go to. And when Jesus says you, you, you neglect justice, he probably has in mind the justice summary of the law, which is a famous passage from Micah 6, 8, uh, which says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, that's the do justice summary of the law, Micah 6, 8. And then love of God is the other major summary of the law, which is, of course, Deuteronomy 6, 5, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Part of the famous Shema prayer that functions in Judaism like the Our Father does in uh, Christianity. And um, so what our Lord is saying to the Pharisees, okay, is not that you guys are too 
morally uptight, okay? That you guys just need to relax and uh, realize that salvation isn't such a serious matter and all you have to do is believe and, and hang out and try not to kill anybody and stuff like that. Okay, no, our Lord is criticizing the Pharisees for being bad interpreters of the law. He's saying, look, if you want to interpret the law of God properly, you need to have a hierarchy where some laws take precedence over others. This is true in all legal systems. And so the most important laws have precedence and that follows from there. You know, like in, in American justice, you know, the, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, okay, takes precedence over a lot of other things. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a hierarchy. And within, within the law of Moses, okay, love for God uh, takes precedence, followed closely because it's very closely related with the doing of justice, which follows on the heels of love, all right? And these have to be at the top. And then things like tithing on your spices are fine, but they're way at the bottom. And so Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees for turning this upside down, majoring in the minors, and neglecting the majors. And um, as a result, they were doing moral evil. I mean, they, would, they were willing to divorce their wives for any and every reason. They weren't faithful to their wives. Um, they committed financial injustices, forms of uh, extortion, and, um, and uh, you know, m m would manipulate religious law for financial gain. Okay, uh, you, know, you know these because these kinds of behaviors are mentioned in the Gospels. And uh, so this is what Jesus is rebuking them for. for. Uh, at the end of our reading, he says uh, to the teachers of the law, you impose on people burdens hard to carry, but you yourselves do not lift one finger to touch them. What does he mean that you impose burdens? It's like these teachers of the law would make these rulings about how to stay clean or how to live by ritual law that were very difficult for the poor people to follow, okay? For example, insisting that you would have to wash after touching this or wash after having contact with that. And the problem for the poor people is they didn't have a lot of place to wash. And they didn't have the opportunity for this. And often because they had to work with their hands and do farm work or fishing or so on, they're often in contact with unclean animals. And so they couldn't stay in a state of ritual cleanliness. And this is only possible for wealthy people who didn't have to work with their hands. And so Jesus is criticizing this. So you, you make these stringent cleanliness rulings and tell the common people that they've got to follow them, which is very hard to do because they're trying to eke out a living. And you don't do anything to help them. You and your comfortable middle or upper middle class lifestyle where, you know, you probably have a private ritual bath in your home where you can wash anytime you need to. So you can feel all good about yourself that you can stay ritually clean all the time. Okay, so this is what Jesus is criticizing them for, for elevating like what would be to us, you know, particular uh, fine issues of canon law. Not that I'm criticizing that. I do think that we should be careful to follow canon law. Absolutely. All right. But Jesus is saying you're elevating that and then neglecting basic morality, basic love of God and love of neighbor. Okay. So this is going on, and, and woe be to us if we do the same thing, okay? Let us not do the same thing, all right? Let, let's not major in the minors. Let's not get all upset about somebody who, say, uses a bad word and, and then over, overlook drunkenness, promiscuity, whatever, okay? Let's not get overly uh, attentive to fine points of, Ritual observance, as important that, as that is, and the proper way to cross oneself or something like that when we're neglecting meditation on God's word, okay, um, making concrete acts uh, to help the poor, um, and other matters of love and God and love and neighbor. You get the idea. So this has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville coming to you on this Wednesday of the 28th week of Ordinary Time. Till next time, God bless you.